Awesome. We got a great showing here. Uh, welcome to this uh, Google office here on uh, Spear Street. My name is MK Palmore. I'm a director in the office of the CISO for Google Cloud and also serving as a chapter uh, leader for the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of Cyversity. So welcome to this event. Uh, our panel on creating a more diverse workforce in the cybersecurity realm. Uh, and we're looking forward to a really good enriched discussion uh, with our panel members, and we are also obviously going to leave time for questions for the attendees. Uh, in order to get us started, though, uh, I've asked uh, one of our leaders here at Google Cloud, Phil Venables, who's the Chief Information Security Officer, to provide some opening remarks. I'm going to give Phil a proper intro. <laughs> so if you'll bear with me for a second here. All right, so Phil is the uh, CISO for Google Cloud, where he leads the risk security, compliance, and privacy teams. Before joining Google, he was a partner at Goldman Sachs, where he held multiple positions over a long career, and he initially started as the first uh, CISO, and he held that role for 17 years. In subsequent roles, uh, Phil was the chief operational risk officer, an operating partner in their private equity business, and a senior advisor to the firm's leadership around cybersecurity, technology, digital business risk, and operational resilience. Before Goldman Sachs, Phil held multiple CISO positions and senior engineering roles across a range of finance, energy, and technology companies. Outside of Google, with all of the free time I'm sure he has, <laughs> Phil is a uh, member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He also serves on the board for the NYU Tannen School of Engineering, the NYU Stern Business School Volatility and Risk Institute, the Information Security and Privacy Advisory Board of NIST, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So if you wouldn't mind, give a healthy welcome to Phil Venables. So thank you. It's like welcome to Google and welcome to this event. You know, we're just really thrilled and proud to be able to host this. And, you know, I'm really pleased to all of our team that partners with Cyversity you know, on all of these important initiatives. You know, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes and, you know, just let, 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 let's get on with the show after that. The, the one thing I want to talk about is the, um, the importance of diversity. Now, I could clearly say diversity is important because it's the right thing to do. So let's just just put that to one side. You know, I could then also say diversity is important uh, because when we're facing a cybersecurity skills crisis and we don't have enough people, and even Google has this challenge, but we don't have enough people across the world to staff all of the important positions we need to not take advantage of our entire population, you know, is the definition of insanity. And so that's important, but let's just put that to side for a minute. For me, the real importance of diversity um, is to do with risk management. And if you kind of take a step back and think, you know, groupthink is the mind killer of, of risk management. When I look back at a long career of doing multiple different types of risk, whether it's in security, financial risk, insurance, resilience, a whole array of things, the common pattern in failures is a failure of imagination and companies and organizations and teams being victims of groupthink in not seeing what is actually coming and not seeing what they need to prepare for. And while you can clearly create a lot of antidotes to groupthink, they're never actually that effective. But the most effective antidote to groupthink is having a diverse team and diversity in all its forms that leads to natural, good, healthy tension, different perspectives in teams. Um, and so fundamentally for me, diversity is literally this foundational concept for all of risk management and especially security risk management. And then beyond that, it's then also important to think about equity and inclusion because if you're successful in having a diverse team, if you're not running an appropriate environment that encourages people are promoted, recognized and their voice is heard in the environment, 
then you're still not going to be effective at countering that group think that is the is the enemy of uh, of effective risk management. So for me, there's all sorts of reasons to do this, but I always centre around on the the only thing that we have to do to make risk management and security better is to make sure that we've got a diverse workforce because that's what brings this this uh, this different set of perspectives and and if if that was the only reason we did it aside from all the other great things and that's like that's you know that's for me is is the reason to do this you know i'm i'm very proud of what google's achieved in this respect I and mean, i think we've we've done a lot uh, we've achieved a lot, we've improved hiring, we've improved retention, we've improved promotions. But again, those that you know me know I kind of, I'm quite well practiced at double think. You know, so I can be very happy with what we've done while still like fundamentally disappointed and recognize that we have to do a huge amount more. And you know, I can, I can be okay with holding those two ideas in my head at any one time. And so we're absolutely committed to do more. And, and so the partnership that we, that we have here uh, and the work we do around the world is is truly important to us, and so you know I think it's just great that we have this event today, and I'm looking forward to sitting down and kind of opening my ears and eyes and listening to the discussion to uh, to make sure I can take some lessons away to keep improving what we're doing um, for the whole mission of risk management and everything else that we need to do. So with that, I'll hand back to uh, to MK to get the show on the road, and thank you. All right, so uh, let me take a moment and invite our three panelists to the stage, and if you guys will take your seat, we'll get them introduced and get started with this discussion. Okay, well, we get a, a full view uh, of the talent that we have on the stage, and so I want to give a moment for Ann Cleveland, Rob Duhart, and Larry Whiteside, Jr. to give some introductions and background on themselves, and let's start with Anne. Welcome. Thanks so much, and thanks so much for having us. And I, before I start, I just want to say it's so great to see so many friends and colleagues in the audience. I know so many of you have worked deeply on this issue, and so I just hope that this conversation can make even a small contribution in helping you advance your own work. Um, I'm Anne Cleveland. I'm the executive director of the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Um, and I'll just tell a quick story by way of introducing myself. My graduate degree is in business. Um, I, before working in cybersecurity, was working in climate tech and climate policy. Uh, and it took my former boss to recognize a pathway for me into cybersecurity, which was, hey, climate and cybersecurity as complex problems are structured similarly, but cybersecurity is three decades behind in finding solutions. So why don't you come over here with us and apply what you know from climate to cybersecurity? Um, and I think if more of us could see those connections, we would expand the diversity of the workforce and the, you know, the people that are attracted to this field. Great, we're happy you're here, Ann, thank you. Rob, welcome, sir. Thank you, thank you. Um, I have to agree with you, Anne. Looking around the crowd, seeing so many amazing people, some that I've known, some that I've met via Meet in the past, others that I'm meeting for the first time. So great to meet you in person. Um, I serve as the Deputy CISO of Walmart and the CISO of Walmart e-commerce. Um, but before that, I spent some time as a Googler myself, so I'm really glad to be here on the stage. Uh, and to spend time with all of you talking about such an important topic. Uh, at Walmart, we're deeply committed to diversity. That's one of the reasons I'm here. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we're having this conversation. And we're grateful to be a part of it. Excellent. Welcome home, Rob Duhart. <laughs> don't make the Walmart people too scared now. That's, someone did say, don't get too comfortable back in the halls of Google. So, you know. Larry. Um, Larry Whiteside, Jr. Um, first. Thank you. Thank you, Google. Um, thank you for all of you showing up. Um, so I am a chief security officer of a national health care company, Women's Care, but that's not the important thing I do. The thing that I do that brings me passion is I'm a co-founder and I'm the current president of Cyversity. We are a 501c3 focused on increasing diversity in this workforce, right? I mean, I, Phil talked about it. Everybody here has talked about the why. Right? But what we have not done as an industry is really figure out the how. Yes. And so for me, my passion over these last couple of years as I've stepped into this role is 
pointing out to the audience and rec helping everybody recognize there's some individual accountability. We can't all sit back and just wait for someone to fix it. We all have to figure out what is our individual role in helping to change that narrative. So I look forward to this dialogue. Excellent. So I, I want to actually pull a thread that Phil touched upon in his opening remarks about the business case for diversity in the cybersecurity workforce. Rob, you want to touch on that just a little bit? Really glad to. Um, I often tell people diversity, the business case makes itself. Uh, Phil touched upon this a little bit, but not just in the context of understanding your adversary, right? So all of us in security realize that we are dealing with humans on the other side of terminals that are hoping to seek uh, havoc on our organizations. The more diverse our teams are, the better we can address those diverse threats that are coming from those humans, right? It's the human side. You'll hear me continue to say this. Beyond that, though, Harvard you know, Business School, GSB at Stanford, many folks have studied and found that organizations that are more diverse are more profitable. They adapt to change better. Um, they can manage the type of organizational and economic dynamics that we all are experiencing today better than non-diverse teams. I think Phil said it great about groupthink. It's not just in the context of risk management. When you think about revenue generation, you think about innovation, diverse teams win. And so when we invest in those types of organizations and in these types of venues and in people that maybe don't look like us, talk like us, think like us, come from where we come from, we are literally creating better organizations. But I think you said something, MK, and so did you, um, Larry. Talking about it is good. And it's great to have a conversation. But what are we doing about it? Right? And, and when you get that great talent in the door, how do you retain that talent? How do you keep that talent? How do you grow that talent? Maximize that talent? I'd love to talk more about that as we spend time. Yeah, we're gonna get to that. Uh, Larry, you wanna bite off on the business case? Yeah, so, so I like to use analogies. For those who know me, I'm a storyteller, right? And so a lot of times when we talk about the business case, people don't know how to articulate that to the people that matter in their organization. So I, I say this, I use the term lens. So raise your hand up in here if you wear some sort of glasses, whether it's reading glasses or, right, exactly, right? Now, how many people in here think they have the exact same prescription as the person next to them? Exactly, you know why? Because every person in here views things view, via a very unique lens. And so by having people that are seeing things, the problems we're trying to solve, through a different lens, you get a different perspective. That is the important part of why this is so important. The group think that Phil mentioned, if everybody in the room is using the same lens to look at a problem, then you're gonna solve it in one particular way because everybody's doing the group think and thinking about that in the same. But if everybody's looking through their own individual lens, because based on their background, based on their upbringing, based on their demographic, they see things completely differently, right? Growing up in an underserved community, I had my house broken into multiple times. I guarantee I look at home security very differently than other people in the room who have never had their house broken into. Those are components of how we have to look at the world and the problem that we're trying to solve. Excellent. Ann? Yeah. Feel free to add in sprinkles around uh, the academic case for <laughs> diversity. Um, so at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, one of our flagship um, research initiatives is to focus on the future of cybersecurity and do future scenarios. And you know, it's very clear to us that one of the pillars of the future of cybersecurity is to expand who participates in cybersecurity in every way that you can think of. Um, and we think of it like this. If we, if you're going to deliver meaningful security, because usable security was pioneered at Berkeley, not that other school that you mentioned. <laughs> I knew I left one out. I apologize. <laughs> um, but you have to always be asking yourself, um, for whom and under what circumstances is security being experienced and security being understood? And if you don't have... Um, diverse humans who understand the other diverse humans who are your customers, your employees, your adversaries, um, you are not going to be able to answer that question about for whom and under what circumstances and deliver meaningful security. So uh, probably like a few folks in the room, I, I have not been in the security realm my entire professional career. 
I came to security by choice uh, and was quite frankly astonished when I got here to the Bay Area in terms of the lack of representation when I would meet with CISOs, CIOs of organizations and talk to them about their security challenges. So I, I mention that because the issue has been known, I think, for quite some time. I also would like to sort of throw in or caveat this with, of all of the industries that are enjoying um, success or growth during this very challenging time, technology, and specifically cybersecurity, is one of the biggest growth fields for professionals today around the world. So we've known about this problem for a long time. Larry, in fact, I hope we'll, we'll dig a little deeper into the organization that uh, he co-founded with some of the co-founders in the room. But we've known about it for a while. Why is it so hard to move the needle? Larry, you want to start on that? Oh, yeah. I could, I, that's a soapbox item for me, right? <laughs> so, again, part of the reason it's so hard is because nobody wants to do anything. Everybody is talking about it. We've been talking about this for well over a decade, right? Devin, one of my co-founders in the back. Raise your hand, Devin, right? Everybody needs, you know I'm always going to call you out. <laughs> Julian, one of our other co-founders and our chairman of the board is sitting back there with him. And here's the reality. We started this organization because we needed, we felt there needed to be a conversation, right, that was more succinctly about the problem. Then we realized everybody knows there's a problem. But as we continued to have the conversation, we also realized nobody was taking the action to own doing something. And so when I started thinking about that in the context of every other aspect of social issues that has happened globally, no social issue has ever happened and been executed upon when it's just the individuals being impacted that are raising their hand saying it's a problem. It's when other non-impacted individuals recognize the impact of the societal issue on them as an individual as well, and they begin to stand up and raise their hand and take some individual accountability. So when I talked about everybody doing something, that means each of you, each of us. Because when you stand up, hopefully then one of your friends sees you stand up, right? When you go to take an action inside your organization, they will, but we have not had that. We have not had that where people recognize the individual impact that they can have as one person to then start the chain reaction, right? If you think about COVID, COVID started with one person in the U.S. It's just one that then impacted somebody else, that then impacted somebody else, that then all got us in this mask. Right? Pro probably somebody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Who was at RSA two years ago. Right. Right. So, so but, but it's, a, it's a great Oops. type of scenario to think about in context. Yeah, it is. As soon as a person stands up and they try and go do something, it is that impetus that then says, well, hey, well, Rob did something. Well, maybe I need to do something. Claire did something, so then maybe I need to do something, right? So that's what has to happen. We need to continue to have the conversation, but we also need to continue to hold our friends and counterparts accountable. If I'm standing up, hey, why are you not standing up with me? Because we all see it as a problem but we've got to recognize we are the only ones that have to stand up as individuals first to enable everybody else to realize that they need to stand up too. And same question for you, and maybe tease in a little bit around the mission statement of CLTC. Yeah, so I, I want to say a huge plus one to what Larry just shared. Um, so why haven't we nailed it? Um, I mean, and cybersecurity is not the only industry that hasn't nailed it, we, let's be honest. And so what do I think is unique about cybersecurity? And I would just you know, double click again on something we think about a lot in our research agenda, which is, uh, and I'm not the first to say this, cybersecurity has a branding problem. Um, you know, think of usual terms, zero trust. Does that make you want to work <laughs> in cybersecurity, thinking that no, you know, nobody trusts you, nobody trusts your employees? Um, and I will never forget a conversation I had when I first joined the center with um, a woman who was studying to be an engineer. So this is someone already in STEM who said, until I was at the Berkeley Cybersecurity Clinic, I never thought that there was a pathway in cybersecurity for me because, you know, she had in her mind this stereotype of hackers in a hoodie sitting in a corner somewhere. 
Um, and so I want to call out, um, Aspen Digital actually did some great work last year, a report on diversity in the cybersecurity field. Um, and I think there's some folks in the room today from there. Um, and one of the recommendations was we need to shift the narrative. Um, it, in terms of you know, actionable things we can do, it needs to be a sustained, multi-year, multi-pronged campaign um, because people don't recognize the variety of jobs that there are in cybersecurity and we are not going to where those diverse people are at with messages that resonate with them. Yeah, let's do a, a little bit of a pulse check. Uh, how many folks in the audience come from non-STEM backgrounds? Yeah, wow. good, a good portion. Okay. Yeah. So it, as... Me too. Yeah, and so as Ann was stating, we have a bit of a branding issue, right? Uh, folks are afraid to even think about coming into our industry because they don't understand the depth of it. They don't understand really the broadness of opportunities right. uh, within the field and the different skill sets that you can bring to the table from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, Rob, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, um, an interesting point to plus one what was said already. Look, I want to do another pulse check. How many of you that are in cyber today did it because you were different than the people around you? I'm in that group. I was in a lunch session last yesterday with a, a great, brilliant engineer. Actually, I think she's a BSO by the name of Alyssa Miller. And she told a story about how she got into cyber and how she got into doing things that maybe everyone wasn't doing in 1993. Um, but how at the time she got on a, onto IRC and it was just a community of what she referred to as misfits. <laughs> and I was one of those misfits. Still am. It, still am. <laughs> if, if Heather Adkins were here to speak of someone who isn't here, she might agree. There's a group of these people that have been in the cyber world for years. And it wasn't that we all looked a certain way. It wasn't that we were all the same type of person. We were actually almost the outcasts. And so somehow that narrative has changed and somehow we do have a branding problem. But to me, I think it's almost getting back to where we came from, which is how do we continue to make our industry reflective of that group of misfits that gathered on IRC, Internet Relay Chat, and did all kinds of ridiculous things back in the 90s. I think we've made progress. I want to say that. I think there are organizations that are working really hard to get this, get this done. There are allies, like Phil Venables, like Royal Hansen, like Jerry Geisler at Walmart, that are fighting really hard to make a difference. But I think there's another step. And what I hear Larry saying is, we have to move away from being bystanders to being participants. And when we all become participants, it becomes exponential. And we start to see the world change in a way that makes a difference for not just people who come from various racial backgrounds, as a black Latino man, but also people that are neurodiverse, also people that are veterans, also people that have disabilities. I think if we all look into our backgrounds, we are probably more diverse than we initially think. And as we work together on this, we can make lots of progress. So uh, all three of you, I think, have mentioned uh, the idea that I want to pull a thread on around allyship and the importance of it. Uh, and can you talk a little bit about what it means to have those from the unaffected communities actually serve as allies in this challenge and also maybe tease in some of what, you know, corporate sponsorship and allyship looks like and how important that is? Yeah, so, you know, just to be real, allyship is a whole lot harder than it looks. I think, um, you know, particularly in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, a lot of people made commitments and thought, oh, we're going to go, you know, we're going to go recruit in diverse communities and realized, you know, just sending your message out on the, the boards to different communities is not a diverse applicant pool going to make. Um, you know, it takes relationships, 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 and those aren't built in a day. And they depend on showing up for each other, having trust, and um, you know something that you know we're all we're all trying to do better at. But I think um, people think it's an on or off switch when in fact it means you know deep community engagement for for a long time and sh show up and show that you're there. Larry, allyship. 
Yeah, so so this is a, another one. I got a bunch of soapboxes. I'm realizing. <laughs> uh, I, I'm pitching them to box. you. You knock them out of the park. <laughs> Go. The so so here's the deal. So we've heard the term "put your money where your mouth is." Yep. Right. That's not allyship. Anybody can write a check. We know our industry is flowing with money. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Diversity will take checks. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear. That helps us fund scholarships and programs, so we will take them. However. <laughs> But what we also need is true allies, right? So I'll give you a, a, an example, right? So Target. So we approached Target, right, to be a sponsor and a partner. And Rich, the CISO of Target, right, in true ally form, said, hey, it's great. We're going to cut you a check. However, what we also want to do is we want to stand up a chapter in the Twin Cities because we don't see enough diversity here. We're going to take the lead for your organization to go into our community to message and build and ensure that we are growing diverse people here from the beginning that's not just going to serve our organization of Target, but going to serve our entire community and the Best Buys and all of the other retail entities that exist. That's allyship. That is not just cutting that check, but getting in, getting your hands dirty, and being a part of what change looks like uh, awesome example rob example. no I, I think that's a fantastic example when we stop thinking self-interest and we start thinking group interest amazing things can happen um i was introduced to some, some of the challenges of allyship that you mentioned in um when there was some asian violence happening um not long after george floyd right and i was challenged to think Okay, so I'm used to people thinking about me, but what am I doing? Am I st standing up to say stop Asian hate? Am I standing up to be a good ally? What does it mean to be an ally? To be honest, I hadn't studied it much. I had not thought about it much. Uh, and as I looked in, you know, introspectively, I realized I had not done a great job. So I really relate to the concept of allyship being hard. Um, but you know what, you know, this is not a, a paid advertisement, but I work for the largest company in the world. We do hard things all the time. We have 2.2 million associates across the globe. It's my job to keep them secure. That's a hard job. We can make the difference that Larry's talking about of transitioning from putting our money where our mouth is to actually making the difference in communities across the globe. Um, I'll use a couple of examples. We have a program called Live Better University where we offer um, associates in stores the opportunity to go to college for free, right? We pay for all room and board, all we pay for, not room and board, but books, tuition. Um, and they study sometimes cybersecurity. And we have a group of about 300 plus who are cybersecurity security students that we partner with to transition from a store into our cybersecurity team. Oftentimes our geniuses are right in front of us. And we as allies just have to open our eyes, open our minds, and open our hearts and actually get something done. So um, this is really hard work. It is. Uh, and I think that even with good intentions, businesses, corporations find themselves in a little bit of paralysis, right? Yeah. Not quite sure what to do. Um, what are your thoughts on whether or not business, business in general, has the tools necessary uh, to change not only the narrative around this issue, but to li literally substantively move the numbers of women, traditionally underrepresented minorities, in their workforce. Do they have the tools to do it, or is there a learning curve involved? Do you mind if I take that one? Yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the question. Thank you. Um, look, we, we say save money, live better. When you think Walmart, um, you probably don't think uh, Dolce & Gabbana and Louis Vuitton, right? You probably think, right, not quite, right? But if you're in a rural community in America and you need food or you need uh, cat, cat food, you need formula, you need milk, Walmart's there, right? Um, there's a trust concept that exists between consumers that are often forgotten in our industry and in our society um, that we uniquely seek to serve. It was one of you know, Sam Walton's uh, first goals of save money, live better. Um, when I talk to our leaders, including Doug McMillan and others, there's an understanding 
um, that our businesses will not be successful if we cannot take that same mantra and that same commitment to solving some of the big environmental and societal problems that we have in front of us. And how we do it differs. Um, but we have to be invested. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a George Floyd thing. It's not a Buffalo thing. It is something that happens all the time. I'm going to go off, uh, off my, my notes for a second and talk about a conversation I had with Doug McMillan very, very recently. And we were talking about Texas. And I asked him, I said, so if we're talking to communities about Buffalo and about Texas, I meet with a group of black technology leaders at Walmart, what is the message you want me to deliver? And he had a lot of very profound things to say that we conveyed. But one of the points he made is, is that we were El Paso three or four years ago. And that was a Walmart store where our associates were targeted. In Uvalde, we had families, children of our associates who were among the victims. This is personal, right? So when, when we're talking to the highest levels of political leaders, which that was a part of that conversation, this isn't just, this is a good idea for society. This is, these are our people that we have to do something for. And I think when leaders across the country, at businesses across the country, start to talk like that and think like that, we will see change. Yeah. Larry, um, corporations, do they have the tools? What, what have you seen that's worked? They do, ha they do have the tools. They just don't have, on their list of stuff to do, right? For, from a Long philanthropic list. standpoint, right? They don't recognize diversity in cyber as high enough because cyber in many organizations is still fighting to have that board spot, right? right? And so until cyber gets that board visibility on a regular basis and then they recognize the impact of the lack of diversity in cyber and how it's negatively impacting their bottom line, they're not going to see it. So do they have the tools? Yes, because they've been doing it in other ways for a long time but it's where it ranks in the level of importance of everything else that they're doing. And that's the challenge, is bubbling that up. We've been bubbling trying to get cybersecurity at the board level for 20 years, right? We're just starting to get it. In the last three to five years, mm -hmm. the NACD, National Association of Corporate Directors, has now said every public company needs to have a cyber expert at the board level, right? So it's starting to get there, but it has to get there first so they know cyber is that important to their bottom line then they have to do that, draw that line, do that cross-correlation to understand that the lack of diversity in cyber is making the gap between our adversaries and us grow so much faster mm -hmm. that we've got to do something now. And I have a separate question for you, but if you want to tag in on that. Oh, no. Hit, hit me with your separate question. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm thinking specifically about the role uh, between academia corporations, public-private partnerships. How does that help change or move the needle on this issue, and how important are these partnerships? Well, there, there are so many ways that these partnerships are important, and um, I have to give out a shout-out to Cyversity for being our partners in this work. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about something we've pioneered at Berkeley, which is a cybersecurity clinic. And I, and I will get to answering your question, I promise. <laughs> um, so these clinics are modeled after law clinics where students for course credit work with a real world client um, and provide cybersecurity technical assistance to them over the course of a semester. It's pro bono work. Um, our clinic happens to work with nonprofits at um, higher risk of politically motivated cyber attack. Um, but there's a group of clinics all over the country now that's become a consortium of clinics. Some of them work with small towns and municipalities. Some of them work with small businesses. Um, and so, so to answer your question, something we've seen out of that experience is how important it is to have students see what cybersecurity is really like in real organizations that they might work for someday, um, particularly civil society organizations that are having an even harder time than, you know, the they might be dealing with kind of different problems, but they're having a harder time with diversity in their workforces than the Googles 
and the Walmarts of the world. Yeah. Um, and those partnerships have been incredibly important and the partners that have supported that work um, generating the next generation of cybersecurity professionals have been invaluable to us. Um, Craig Newmark is here today. Newmark Philanthropies has support right. and supported that work. Um, so that partnership has been key. Um, Thank you, Craig. Microsoft has supported that work. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that oh, here. You can, <laughs> you can say it in these um, and, the, and, the, you know, and there are more and more corporate philanthropies um, supporting that work. And I know, you know a number of people here are involved actually in scholarships and work that are also supporting um, community colleges to have those public-private partnerships, and I just, huge shout out to that. No, and, and actually, you bring up a, a great point uh, by mentioning uh, Microsoft. I mean, we have Walmart here represented. This is an industry it is. Uh, challenge, it and is. there's no way that one organization Everyone. is going to be able to uh, change the entire industry collectively. We need to agree and understand that this is an industry challenge, and by doing that, then devote the resources to changing it. And if we get away from sort of the singular uh, vision of only looking at it from the perspective of your individual company, I think yes. it helps. So uh, there was something that was mentioned earlier around branding. Rob, I, I'd, I'd like for you as a, you know, you're a leader in a large scale cybersecurity apparatus. What do we need to be doing at the hiring manager level yeah. to get them to recognize right. women, underrepresented minorities in those pools of applicants that they're looking at? Studies have shown that um, job descriptions matter. Uh, if you have a job description for an entry-level position and it asks for a CISSP and a CCSP and a CISM, right, that probably isn't going to generate a lot of interest, one, or diverse interest, two. Um, studies have also shown that hiring managers tend to hire what they're comfortable with, right? And whether that's people that look like them, people that are from where they're from, went to schools that they went to. Um, you have to, we have to equip up and down the layers of our organization skills to fight bias, right? We have courses that we put thousands of our managers through um, where they fight that unconscious bias, not just in the context of hiring, but also in the context of promotion, and also in the context of retention, right? Um, there's a process at Google called PERF. It exists at every company in America. It's not called PERF. Um, and another reason why we have diversity challenges is because there are roadblocks that exist in all of these processes. How do we defeat that and equip managers to do it? And I tell you, it starts at the top. I once worked with a leader who stood up and said, if I find out that somebody is doing something inappropriate to limit the opportunities for women in this organization, I will do everything in my power to fire you. That was not at Walmart, that was not at Google. But it delivered a message from the top of what is acceptable and what isn't. And I think time is, is coming and we see people doing this. You have to draw a foot in the sand. Right. So Larry, if you wouldn't mind taking on the mantle of sort of that, that C-suite um, necessary vantage point and maybe extend that to the board. How important is that in changing the narrative around the issue and actually making change? Yeah, so so I, I can't put a level of importance on it because that's the highest importance. Yes. If your C-suite doesn't understand and agree that it's a problem, right? So every role I've had, the first conversation I have once I get hired is with the head of HR. Mm. Right, because a lot of times CISOs take the role of well, HR deals with all the hard. They'll get me the resumes I need to see, but we don't take the active role in understanding what are the blocks, what are the hurdles that are put in that HR process that are not getting me the resumes I need to see. Absolutely right, and that's that barrier. And so we, the C-suite in every organization in technology in cybersecurity, has got to ensure that we are taking ownership of that part. We are holding HR accountable. We're holding our leadership accountable at the executive level, right? This is important to us. These are the barriers that I need to ensure are removed, right? Because what happens is, listen, I don't blame HR, right? Because they're operating in the model that they're accustomed to. Now, I consider cybersecurity, we're unicorns, right? In the field of technology, we are a unicorn. And we're a unicorn because, A, we do something that's a little different, right? We also have created this mechanism where our salary structure is also vastly different. Mm -hmm. But HR operates in certain models. 
oh, we've got salary bans. Well, for these salary bans, there needs to be these requirements. Well, if a salary ban requires a degree for a regular technologist, in cybersecurity, it's likely not necessarily the case that it needs to. But because they operate within this band, oh, that's a requirement. But if you don't go check with HR and know that ahead of time, you won't know that. And so you have enabled and allowed a barrier to exist that's negatively impacting your security organization. So every C-level leader in a security organization has to take that ownership. And if you're not the C-level leader, you can still take that ownership and go to your C-level leader. Start asking those questions. Start identifying if that's a thing. Because those are the things that enable or disable what we're trying to achieve. I think Larry made a great point. All of our C-suite leaders love to win. I think Phil likes to win. <laughs> so when I'm in the room with Doug or whomever, and I say, look, we're losing the war. Right. We are losing the battle. Do you want to win? The answer is usually yes. And then we get to, well, how do you win? Right. And then when you say that, then you can get in front of your HR leaders and have a very, uh, an important but perhaps uncomfortable conversation with them Absolutely. to say, this is what it takes to win. Let's do it. Why not? Hashtag winning, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a two-pronged question for each of you. We'll start with Ann. What do we need to keep doing, and what do we need to stop doing? Mm. 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 Great question. I'm not even sure I can do it justice, but let me take a stab. So I want to pick up on something, actually, that I think both of, of you have mentioned, but you mentioned, I think, really poignantly, Rob, with Walmart, is connecting to people's sense of purpose. Um, and that is a thing I think that we need to keep doing and do, you know, 100x, 1,000x more. Um, you know, we get more diverse students into cybersecurity when we connect with the sense of purpose that they already have. So when they are in a cybersecurity clinic, say they're a student in business, and then they're in a cybersecurity clinic that is helping small businesses, or they're a student in urban planning, and they're in a cybersecurity clinic that is helping small towns and municipalities with cybersecurity. You know, I was talking to actually the director of a cybersecurity center at one of the um, HBCUs in Tennessee the other day, and they are located in one of the lowest income zip codes in the country. And she wants her students' cybersecurity community outreach from that college to be serving that community. So again, you know, she's connecting to the sense of purpose. And I think you know, that can make an enormous difference in, in who we're able to attract and retain and have a sense of belonging in this field. Um, in terms of stop doing uh, maybe I'll just pick up on something that I think Larry has said really eloquently, which is, you know, stop being words and no action. Um, you know, make sure that when you're talking about allyship, you know, and I'll say from an academic perspective and let these distinguished gentlemen weigh in from an industry perspective, but does your research agenda, um, in addition to trying to help with cybersecurity risk management, actually redress harm? It, does your research agenda center redressing harm um, in ways that you think will lead to outcomes where um, race or any other characteristic is no longer a predictor of outcomes? Um, but again, that takes, in Larry's words, actions, not words. Excellent. Right down the line. Rob, what do we need to keep doing? What do we need to stop doing? We need to do this. We need to have these conversations and be okay being a little bit uncomfortable, right? I spoke about my journey with understanding what it means to be an ally. That was an uncomfortable conversation, but I had to have it. And I think we all need to continue having these conversations um, in our own spheres of influence. I think Larry said it perfectly with his COVID example, but exponential growth, right? Each of us go reach out to five or six people that we work with. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're beating people up or being rude. It's having a conversation um, and saying, this is important, and I think it is, and I want to work through this. Let's do that together. Um, what do we stop? Um, let's stop being afraid. And I get it, right? As a person who's underrepresented, who's a protected class in many different senses, it's probably easier for me to say, don't be afraid, than for someone who isn't in that category. Um, 
But I think the more fearlessly we can have these conversations and connect with each other and support one another, the better we'll be. Stop being afraid. That was 2020. <laughs> it's 2022. It's time. To you, Larry. Ooh, this is a big question. Um, so what do we need to start doing? Keep doing and stop doing. So, so keep doing. Right. Um, I mean, they answered a number of it. Right. Keep doing is is continue to have the dialogue. But I think, again, to a point that I've said uh, to a point that Rob continued is take the dialogue down to the individual level. Figure out how each of you can have that dialogue in your circles with your leadership, with your peers, with your staff, because it's that aspect of individual dialogue and communication that is going to build the swell that we need to make the change, right? So I think we need to keep having these sessions. We need to keep having them on stages. We need to keep having them in places where others are going to hear it and take heed, right? Because at some point, someone's going to say, okay, why does this conversation keep happening? What, what, what am I missing, right? And so they're going to want to step in and get involved. That's my prayer anyways. Stop doing. So I think this goes to barriers, and this is no offense to the certification organizations that exist out there, but I think we need to stop looking at certifications as, uh, uh, stop utilizing them as barriers and look at them for what they are. Mm -hmm. Certifications are determinations of competency, period. That's what they were created for, was to determine a person's competency to be able to perform, perform certain actions, right? What is the skill that they bring to the table based on that certification? But what we've allowed to happen is we've allowed the industry to, be, uh, to start utilizing those certifications as a barrier to entry, right? Oh, what do I need to do to get into cybersecurity? Oh, you should go get your security plus. What? Right? No, that's, that, that's not the answer. It's not. But that's what we do. That's what we've done. That's what we've enabled and allowed. So we need to stop looking at certifications for beyond what they actually were meant to be. So um, to close out questioning, I want to give each of you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the organizations that you represent, maybe uh, what's on the roadmap, what ideas that you guys have, and they don't necessarily have to be confined to the um, DEI space, but tell us what's on the roadmap for CLTC. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, so the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity is a research center at University of California, Berkeley. Um, I said this already, but um, if there's one thing that you remember from, from this, we focus on the future. So what's three to five years over the horizon for cybersecurity? And we work to expand who participates in cybersecurity in a very broad sense of that word. Um, so for us on the horizon, uh, we, in 2018, we published Cybersecurity Futures 2025. This year, we're going to start on, and believe it or not, the future arrives faster than you think. So the shelf life on that is already pretty much expired. Uh, so this year, we're going to start on Cybersecurity Futures 2030. Mm -hmm. um, and we really would... Uh, we're centering um, diversity at the center of those futures. What does cybersecurity look like for all kinds of people in 2030? So it's an invitation to please, if you're at all interested in getting involved in that, please come talk to us after the session. Um, and then the, the, the other thing that I would just like to invite people into is we think there should be a cybersecurity clinic in every state in this country um, and every country in the world for that matter because y'all are looking at global workforces. Um, and uh, we think we can do it with a little bit of effort with a group of universities, colleges, and community colleges working together. So if you'd like to get involved in that work, please also come speak with us. Excellent. Rob, you can uh, get on the Walmart soapbox for a little bit if you like. <laughs> Well, long term, 2030, that's long term. That's long. I like that. In the cybersecurity um, world. Absolutely. Uh, many of us struggle to think about two years <laughs> right. uh, from now. Um, so at Walmart, we're focused on two things over the next two years. Uh, the first is people, which we've been talking about quite a bit. That's why we're here and in this room today. Um, a gentleman by the name of Ibra Winkler, who we recently added to the team, likes to talk about human-centric security uh, and the people element. Uh, Gary Sims, another leader in our organization, thinks about that quite a bit as well. We're thinking about 
how do we think of cyber in the context of the humans that consume cyber? For those that don't know, we have 2.2 million associates across the globe, 120,000 of which are in China. Right? I could go down the line. We have about 990,000 not in the United States. We have to think about cyber in a way that's a little bit different than other places. And being able to educate and appeal to the humans that work in our stores and that shop in our stores and to be a part of these major movements is something we think about. Number two is trust. And some of my friends here at Google have heard that a couple of times uh, before. We want to be your trusted source of X. And we know that to do that, cyber and diversity and our commitment to people, um, our, our uh, values as a company and what we stand for are all a part of that. Uh, and we're hoping to earn that trust. Some of you we've earned that trust for already. Some of you we have work to do. Uh, we're very excited to earn that trust over the next few years uh, and continue to grow the discipline. Excellent. Larry, talk to us about Cyversity. What's on the roadmap? Um, so we've got a lot, right? So uh, at Cyversity, our goal is to continue to build programmatic opportunities to bring more people in, right? That's from every level. And for those who are in it, right, so many of you in the room, we want to take you from where you are to where you want to be, right? We recognize that the journey of a cybersecurity practitioner is not just getting in the field because we, we haven't really dug into the whole retention thing a lot, right? But that's a piece of it. So we want to ensure that there are more diverse C-level executives. And we've, with that, we've got to help them get from where they are to where they want to be. The big thing on our agenda right now is we've got our national conference coming up in November. Mm. And so we are building and planning. And the big thing about our national conference is it's an opportunity for us to come together not just to have this dialogue, but to give diverse candidates an opportunity to do things they hadn't before. Right? When you look at the RSA stages, when you look at a lot of the conference stages, you do not see a lot of diverse people that get opportunities to keynote. You do not see a lot of diverse people that get opportunities to present on things that they do well. So for us, our conference is an opportunity for that to prepare people for these bigger stages. So for us, that's a big thing we are planning for, we are working for. Uh, we hope to see many of you out there. There are a number of you in the room that are working with our planning committees uh, to, to help make this the best event possible. And this will be our first one in three years. And so we're looking for this to be an amazing, amazing uh, time, journey, and opportunity. And we will note the Chief Diversity Officer for Google, Melanie Parker, yes, agreed to do the keynote for that particular conference. So we're yes. grateful to have her participation and Google support uh, of that event. So I, I, I want to open the floor uh, to questions. You have a, a esteemed panel here who has a ton of thought leadership and a lot of skin in the game on this issue. Let's have some questions. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so JC Vega, I have a question. Uh, kind of goes with what Bill was saying about being satisfied, but then really <laughs> How are you getting the external validation that you're doing it right and you're doing it enough? And I use that to, mm. as own self-reflection, you know, being here at RSA, it doesn't look like this crowd in here. Right. And it was, the epiphany came when I brought some people of color with me to, to an event with Chairman Julian Waits. <laughs> and they said to me, there's no one that looks like us here. Yeah. And I realize I'm maybe getting a little blind to that because I'm pushing and pushing and pushing, but that was my external validation that I have to do more. How are you getting your external validation as opposed to feeling good about what you're doing already? Right. Who wants to tackle that? I, I, I can jump in on that. So there's never enough, right? There's, there's no way. Because if you ever get to the point where you think you've done enough, that means you're stopping. So there's never enough. This is, this is an ongoing journey that there's no end for, right, is to ha continue to have this dialogue. Because what happens is once you think it's done is when you take your eye off the ball, right? And so we can't take our eye off of this ball, so it's never done. So from a validation standpoint, it's the fact that these things are happening, right? So the validation is as we begin to see the Walmarts having these dialogues and actioning, the Googles having this dialogue, Phil coming in and having this dialogue, the actioning is the validation that we're looking for, right? So it, it's not just that we are talking about it, it's not just going into a room and seeing more diverse people, it's the actioning that you hear from the leaders, 
right? Seeing Claire here as the head of IC squared, right? Their participation. What CLTC, like, it's the actioning of people. So that's the validation when you're seeing the action happening in the industry. We've got Sarah. So I'm going to call Sarah out from Google. She's one of our unsung heroes. She She's been a huge component of ensuring that Google... For yeah. years. It's the actioning, right? So that's, that's the confirmation, is that continued actioning and seeing more organizations jumping out, raising their hands, and putting their people in and putting their people out there. Larry, can I add one more? Yes. I would say, uh, so being at Google for David Driven, I would say let's look at the data, right? We publish a uh, diversity report. Is your company publishing a d diversity report, and do we see that those actions that Larry's speaking about being reflected in those numbers at every level, right? Is the hiring there? Is the promotions uh, also represented? And is the retention there as well too? Attrition, once we get people in, is a big issue because we haven't cultivated the environments for them to stay. So let's look at the data and let that guide us into what should be the further actions that we should con continue pressing hard on. Thank you. Agreed, thank you. Hey, so um, uh, the subject of retention, I want to, um, tackle that very quickly okay. because you're right we didn't I think include that as part of the conversation so uh, if you'd like 30 seconds on the, the the challenge of retention and I think retention quite frankly is a problem across a lot of different variables within the, the current day workforce how is that a challenge maybe uh, as we look at including or increasing our diverse numbers I may not be the best person to ask about this because academia tends to have the opposite problem where people, people are retained. Really, once you get in academia. <laughs> retained too long. Over retained. Um, but I'll, I'll just say one thing and then let my colleagues speak with their expertise on this. I do think we sometimes don't talk enough about the B in DEIB, that, that belonging piece. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly hard to measure. It's incredibly hard to get a sense of. But if you get it right, then you will retain your people and they will recruit their friends. Right. Right. Rob. Imp imposter syndrome is real, right? We all know yes. this. Um, having a conversation with some young people at the RSA Scholars Dinner last night, um, someone said, look, I don't see anybody that looks like me. And I said to her, I said, you belong here. And you may be the only African-American woman in your PhD program at Purdue, but imagine what people will see because you're there you belong there. So I think a part of the belonging piece is that we have to continue to affirm that people belong and that this is a place for them. On the retention side, I think we have a pipeline development challenge. Let's be honest, uh, senior black executives in this room, it's, it's kind of ring around the rosy, right? Like we, we pull the same people from the same morgues across yeah. the the, the apparatus, um, and what we don't necessarily have is a growing of that next generation. And I think something that is indicative of solving the problem, to get to the uh, previous question, is how are we feeding that pipeline and is it producing? You mentioned HBCUs. We have some strong partnerships with HBCUs. So does Google. Um, we need to have stronger pipelining for people to come replace MK and to replace Rob and to replace Devin, and to replace Mr. Watts, right? Like, we have to continue to develop and grow. Yeah, so let's double click a little bit on that representation matters piece and how important it is for folks entering the industry to see people, and I, I, I know people maybe get tired of hearing this, but they wanna see people that look like them and reflect their journey, growth, values, in positions of responsibility. Otherwise, they don't believe there's a path for themselves. Right, Larry? So, so we've all heard the term, you emulate what you see. Mm. Why do you think people in underserved communities continue to fall for the same problems? They're emulating their environment, right? So we, th listen, this is Sharon's soapbox, right? I, I, I'm, I'm gonna call you out, Sharon, right? We have got to do more to foster growth from within the community. The challenge is, is there's no programmatic offerings. Right? For those of us who did reach a C-level role, mm -hmm. we didn't go through some specific training to do that. We didn't have someone who pulled us up. Right? We demonstrated a certain capability, ended up getting our first role, used that to grow to our second role and so forth. Right? So we've got to start, and one of the things that Sharon is our strategy officer for, for Cyversity, we're looking at building some aspect 
of some programmatic capability to get people who are at their mid-level career up into that next phase. Because we need that. That's the only way it's going to continue to happen. Or our opposite counterparts that don't look like us, who've got their friends and their so forth, they're going to continue to grow faster than we are because they're just pulling them up. And we don't, we just don't, we don't have the breadth that they do to be able to do, the, do it in the same way. So we've got to create them so that when they get into these opportunities, when they get an opportunity to interview for that role, they are shining so bright that it makes no sense that someone that doesn't ha hire them. Teased in there is the importance of mentorships and developing sort yes, of that mentoring right. council that I think everyone needs. Another question from the audience. Yes. Uh, um, towards the back there. Sorry, oh, I'm just trying to make sure I'm okay. still over <laughs> okay. Rolanda, Rolanda Small, um, head of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Proofpoint. I wanted to say, um, I know that we have this shortage of talent, and we know that we have a limitation on the number of diverse people working in mm -hmm. cybersecurity. So they're maxed out, they're tapped out, they are tired, they're working hard to prove themselves in these companies. They're doing, they're mentoring, they're doing everything they can. How do we match these programs with these companies so that we can bridge that gap because I think that's where the real strain comes in. The companies just don't have the capacity because the talent is already maxed out. So how do we connect those things so that we can continue to take it forward? I think that's where a huge struggling point is for me. So I'll jump in on that. So, so this is where community comes in, right? So one of the big, big, big things for me at Cybersity is creating chapters. The reason chapters are important is because in every community that all of us live in, there is underserved and diverse people that can thrive in this if they know about it. It's important, so wherever you work and wherever you live, you've got to utilize the resources you have to go into your local community to begin to pull out those people and show them that this is something for them, right? I like to tell a story. So I've got five children, right? So. Gasp if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my, my oldest two are twins. They're 23 now. Uh, and, and my daughter graduated with a cyber degree last year. Now. But at the age of 10, she was convinced that she could not do math. Mm. Because that's what she felt. That's what her circle told her. That's what the teachers made her feel, that she couldn't do math. Right Now, luckily, she had me as a father, so I went in and argued with the teacher that, hey, no, she did it right. Just because she didn't use your formula doesn't mean it was wrong. She did it right. But that made her feel like she wasn't doing it well. That happens. But it took me going in and helping to give her the constant affirmation constantly. And by the time she got to be a sophomore in high school, then it just clicked. And she knew. And she didn't believe what people told her because she was doing it. Right? So in our communities, there are many girls like that. In our communities, there are many un people in underserved communities that feel that because they don't have a champion. So, but what they need is they need to be able to see someone that looks like them, that comes from a similar background, that they say, oh, wait, what? She did? Oh, maybe I can do it. Maybe I shouldn't believe what's being fed to me because I see someone that looks like me that did it. And so that's why it's important for us to go into our communities, right? I, I, I do a thing in my community. I've done it for years. I go into underserved churches. Now, I go in under the premise that I want to do cyber online safety. Well, technically, that's a five-minute conversation, <laughs> right? <laughs> the other 25 minutes is helping them say, well, cybersecurity, what is cybersecurity? Well, why are, you, why are you dressed like that in cybersecurity, right? <laughs> <laughs> because the image that they have of what it is is totally different. Yeah. So I go in there, and then I begin to tell them about what it is. I tell them that I came from communities like theirs. And they, they because when I ask them what, how do they define success for their children, it is athlete, right? It is entertainment, it is doctor, it is lawyer. That's, that's what they see. They don't say, oh, I want my child to be a technologist. Oh, I want my child to be in cybersecurity. They don't, they don't know what that is, right? So it's your communities are the most important aspect that there is as it relates to growing that pipeline and changing this narrative. Another can question. I say, can I say one thing to that real quick? Yep, uh, go make ahead, it fast. I want to talk to the uh, minority folks in the room that are leaders. You need to put your own oxygen mask on first. So there are people in this room, including folks I'm looking at, who've told me this my career, and I didn't listen well. 
I was busy trying to put oxygen masks on everybody around me. We need to be able and feel comfortable to take care of ourselves. It doesn't mean you're not supporting the community. It just means before you, you exhaust the oxygen, giving it to everyone else, that you can breathe too. Question in the back of the room. Yeah, Oliver Barrett from Google. Uh, first off, thank you so much for all of your time today. This is really inspiring and motivational, and I have my own set of AIs leaving, so thank you. Uh, but I wanted to ask a question about geographic diversity, because I think, at least at Google, one of the biggest tools we have is getting out of the Bay Area and New York and yes. some of these areas where, you know, I think, and you said this, like to meet people where they are in this workforce and create diversity, because I think geographic diversity lends itself so much to other kinds of diversity. And I think that's one thing that, um, COVID has really helped in a way, is that enabling this and opening this up. Yes. However, I think it does create then a, a risk that now you might be the one person out of 10 on the other screen, but you might also have this diversity where you don't look like the other people in the room who are now having those hallway conversations, those opportunities. So I, I mean, I, you know, it's a good first step, but I think to the point about belonging, we have to really focus on that. How are you all handling that? And do you have any strategies on that belonging as we create a more diverse workforce, but they may be remote. I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, look, so first off, our headquarters is in Bentonville, Arkansas, right? <laughs> the, the kind of people you meet in Bentonville, Arkansas are a bit different than the kind of people you meet walking the streets in San Francisco, <laughs> right? And I've had this conversation uh, in multiple contexts, but um, we are an Arkansas company. Now, we have regional locations across the country, and we're proud of those locations. Atlanta's a new one, Oliver. I know you know a little bit about Atlanta. I know Google's building one that Mecca's leading in Atlanta as well. Charlotte, Toronto, Seattle, we have one here in San Francisco, right? So we're doing the regional model. Um, could we do better? Um, I think we all want to do the best we possibly can, and we're learning and working through the journey. Um, geographic diversity is huge. I, if I had a dollar for how many times I spoke to someone in Arkansas who said they think we're just hicks in Arkansas. They don't know that we have PhDs. They don't know that we have the fourth accredited forensics lab uh, by a corporation in the United States that we take chain of custody from federal government investigations on. We, nobody knows that. We're just Arkansas, right? We're Bentonville. I think your point on geographic diversity is one that we're just scratching the surface on as an industry. And that if we get that right, it can be a huge weapon um, in terms of improving these challenges and improving these problems. And it transcends race and gender and all the other socioeconomic standards. Uh, and it can be a true tool for equity um, across our industry. Anne or I, I, Just to one quick point to build on Rob's great points. I do think, though, that we risk, you know, we're leveling the playing field geographically, and then we r risk screwing that all up again if we have a different playing field between kind of people who are working remote and people who are working in the office and people who are working hybrid. And um, I don't know anybody who's solved or completely figured that out yet, but I, I do think it's something that we all need to have on our minds. Okay. Uh, I think we got time for one more question from the audience. Yes. Um, so my name is Weijia Yan, and I am a student from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'm really passionate about CMU, cyber. Oh, Carnegie yes. Mellon, that's right. <laughs> Got two um, alums right here. Yeah. And my question Four. is, how can I contribute, and what can I help to make an impact and bring more diverse talents to our industry? Uh, uh, all right. So the individual so, journey, I think. Uh, might yeah, be, yeah. Uh, so I mean, I, I'll jump on that soapbox, but. You're here. That's the start. You're here. Right? Like, like that's the start. And, and so being here and taking the things that you've heard, that you've learned, the connections that I hope you make through conversations to your community, right? So, so take that into your community, to the, the young ladies that you begin to interact with who you think may have a little bit of interest and they're asking you questions about what you do and why are you studying that and why is it, oh, that seems interesting. Those are the ones, right? Start to share what you've learned and then the next opportunity you have to participate in this, right, then you bring them along, right? It's, that's where it starts. It's that individual little journey of you first having the curiosity and having the foresight to say, I'm going to go attend that. 
and then raising your hand to ask a question and then taking the things you've learned to go back to your circle. That's the community I'm talking about, right? When I talk community, it starts like that. What? <laughs> yeah, that's tomatoes. that's my board. That's yeah, my tomatoes. chairman of my board. Just throwing Throw tomatoes, tomatoes from the audience. <laughs> this is what the. <laughs> so we are in the process of discussing putting together a, a Pittsburgh chapter. We do have a number of members in Pittsburgh, so there is an opportunity there. So make sure that you are connecting with us and Maggie, our executive director, is in here somewhere, and we're having those dialogues. <laughs> Yes, I, and that yeah. mentoring program. Yes, so yeah. when we talk, there's a, there's a number of things that you can get involved in, right, to both. And here's something I want to clear up, right? So we've talked about mentoring a little bit, right? We haven't talked about it a lot. How many people in here are mentors? How many people in here have mentors? Right, so I asked that question because I want everybody to understand this. Yeah. It does not matter where you are at in your career. You could be in this for 30 years or three or one. You should both have a mentor but be a mentor. There is someone behind you. If you are a year in your field, right, there is someone who is trying to get in that is going to be going on the journey that you want and need some guidance. So recognize that everyone, no matter where you're at, has the opportunity and should be both a mentor and a mentee. Excellent. Ann. Just a, a quick one. Hold your leadership accountable. We are pushed in the best of ways by our students, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm humbled constantly by what we're learning from the students at Berkeley, and I'm sure it's the same at CMU. When you said that, I wanted to look at Sarah, but I don't think she's here uh, right now. She's an expert at holding leaders accountable. Speak up, which you've done already. Be bold. Right? It's going to feel a little bit lonely at times. It's going to be a little bit hard. But you have to do it so that the person that comes behind you, as Larry said, knows that someone else is doing the same. All right. Hey, how about a round of applause for our panelists? Uh, I want to take a moment to thank uh, Phil for his opening remarks. Also thank uh, our sponsors, Google Cloud, CLTC, Cyversity, for helping to pull this, uh, this event together. Um, I also want to take a moment to sort of highlight, if you'll give me a moment, uh, some of my fellow chapter leaders from the Bay Area Cyversity chapter, Rolanda, who asked a question. Rolanda Small, <laughs> proof point. Hakeem Oseni, Salesforce. Where's, where's Olivia? Olivia, Hereford, and I think we might be missing one. Is Monique here? No, she's not. Okay, so uh, folks are folks are engaged in this activity um, in addition to their day jobs. Uh, this is what we are passionate about. We're all trying to move the needle on this. We need allies. We need folks to take up the uh, the mantle and the assist on lifting this issue and getting it in front of the right folks so that we can garner support uh, on this issue. But it's very important, I think, and it sounds like it might be a part of the Berkeley research, I think the diversity issue is central to cybersecurity it surviving is. over the next decade. It is. Uh, and, and getting it right. It is. Uh, because there's probably an argument that maybe in cybersecurity we haven't been getting it right for a very long time. So thank you, everyone, for attending this event. Thanks for all the support. And uh, we look forward to continuing the dialogue on this issue. Yep. Uh-oh. Security officer at BCD Travel. I also sit on the board at Cyversity. I want to thank you, MK. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> MK, MK has been pushing Cyversity. He is an ally. He has been, he's responsible for bringing a lot of us to this room. And so without your leadership here in the Bay Area, I, Olivia, Hakeem, Rolanda, you know, thank you guys for really making this special and making this a place for this kind of talent and this kind of dialogue. So thank you for your leadership. Awesome, thank you. And I saw Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, because you pushed us as well. You know, Rob said he, she pushes. She's.
doing her job, right? <laughs> and it's really helped for us to grow as well. So thank you. Thank you, Google, for, for these partnerships. And just thank you all for being here. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay. <laughs>